so what is the neural basis of schizophrenia? Before I start to look at that, we need to refresh our memories about some important neurotransmitter receptor systems. First of all, glutamate receptors. Remember, glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. It has metabotropic and ionotropic subtypes. The ionotropic include NMDA receptors associated with memory and the famous magnesium block, AMPA receptors and the much less well-known kinate receptors. Dopamine is a slightly simpler picture because they're all G-protein coupled receptors. There are five of them, but you only need to know about two of them. D1, D2, D3, D4, and D5. D1, they're all excitatory, and as are D5. D2, D3, and D4 are inhibitory. We don't really need to know about D3, D4, and D5, so let's keep it to D1 and D2. First thing to notice about schizophrenia and its treatment is that the two transmitter systems in schizophrenia are dopamine and glutamate. The very interesting thing about dopamine is that when you look at the drugs that are currently available, which work for the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, and plot them on, on one axis, their dose required to be effective, and on the other axis, their IC50, that is how, how effective they are at a D2 receptor, we find this lovely linear relationship. So in other words, the stronger they bind to D2 receptors, very predictably, we can predict how good they are going to be at controlling schizophrenia. Other evidence for dopamine involvement are that bromocryptine, which is an agonist of D2 receptors, introduces schizophrenia-like behaviour in animals. Amphetamine, which causes the release of dopamine, induces schizophrenia-like symptoms in man and mice. But turning now to glutamate, NMDA receptor antagonists, such as vancyclidine and ketamine, induce some of the symptoms of schizophrenia too. So in other words, activating D2 dopamine receptors or activating NMDA glutamate receptors causes a state very much like schizophrenia. Let's look at the dopamine pathways in the brain. There are actually three pathways that you need to be aware of. The mesocortical pathway from the ventral tegmental area to the cortex, the nigrostriatal pathway from the substantia nigra to the striatum, the mesolimbic pathway from the ventral tegmental area to limbic systems of the brain. There's also the tubero infundibular pathway, which goes down into the pituitary, and as you can imagine, that's important in. So what are the pathways involved in schizophrenia here? Well, you might remember we talked about positive and negative symptoms. It's, there's strong evidence that negative symptoms are associated with excessive D1 receptor activity in the mesocortical pathway, whereas the positive symptoms are associated with excessive D2 activation in the mesolimbic Sorry, low, low D1, sorry, in the mesocortical pathway. Low D1, not high D1 in the mesocortical pathway. So if the positive and negative symptoms are dissociated between these two pathways, can we pharmacologically change the dopamine? The first drug which alters dopamine signaling and the first real antipsychotic was discovered by accident, and that was chlorpromazine. A researcher called Henri Laborie was looking for new sedative drugs and came up with chlorpromazine and found it had an unprecedented calming effect, particularly on psychotic patients. Chlorpromazine blocks a lot of receptors, and that's why they originally called it large actyl, but its an antipsychotic effect is due to its action on D2 dopamine receptors. It's a member of the phenothiazine family, of which paracyazine and flufenazine are also members. 
And as you can see, they all have the same basic structure with a three membered ring and a tail and various substitutions at different parts of the molecule. And that gives them different side effects. By the way, you might recognize chlorpromazine looks very similar to carbamazepine. So although they have different chemistries, it all comes down to how potent they are on the D2 receptor. So in this diagram, we've shown you the head with the two uh, R groups where you can have different substitutions to produce different molecules with slightly different properties. So those are the phenothiazines. There are also other molecules that are not phenothiazines, which are also what we call first generation antipsychotics. You'll often hear this phrase first generation and second generation antipsychotics or atypical antipsychotics. There's no real meaning in the term. It's just to do with history, so it really doesn't mean very much at all. Flupentixol is, looks like a phenothiazine, but it's not. It doesn't have a nitrogen in the middle ring. And the well-used antipsychotic haloperidol is nothing like a phenothiazine. We said that chlorpromazine acts on several receptors. In fact, all the first generation antipsychotics are fairly promiscuous with their action on different receptors. So that means they're going to have different side effects and you'll gradually build up the ability to predict what their side effects are. With that table I've given you, you can see that some of them are acting on alpha adrenergic receptors, alpha 1, H1, histamine receptors, muscarinic acetylcholine receptors and 5-HT receptors. So if they're acting on alpha adrenergic receptors, as you might expect, one of the side effects is hypertension. Through their action on histamine receptors, we have sedation. Muscarinic receptors, action is why they have dry mouth, constipation and urinary retention. It's exactly the same profile as we saw with our drugs. Here are some second generation antipsychotics. You should be aware of these four, risperidone, quetiapine, olanzapine and clozapine. Again, don't worry about the structures, just be aware that they exist and, and recognize the names. They tend to be more selective for D2 than first generation antipsychotics. So they're more selective for D2, but doesn't mean they don't have side effects because Selectivity for a receptor does not mean selectivity for a brain region. That's because there are dopamine receptors in the gut and in the spinal cord and so on, and in other projections in the brain. So they will have side effects. Can we predict it from what we know about these receptors in the brain? Well, yes, we can. One thing you can do, which is quite clever, is to use not antagonists but D2 agonists. So these are partial D2 agonists and the way they work is quite clever because a partial D2 agonist at the right concentration will be an agonist of some receptors but by um, competitive block will effectively be an antagonist at other receptors. So remember a partial agonist doesn't evoke a full response. And you can use partial D2, D2 partial agonists such that they affect the mesocortical pathway with the, which has the positive symptoms. So the action there is to block them so we stop the positive symptoms. But very cleverly, they don't block the receptors in the um, nigrostriatal pathway, so you don't get the extra pyramidal effects. So all antipsychotics pretty much have similar side effects and kind of side effects, as we've been saying. For instance, there are receptors for dopamine in the chemical trigger zone of the midbrain, which we'll be talking about in a later lecture, uh, and that makes them actually quite good antiemetics. So it sometimes surprises people to be prescribed 
uh, they come to the, they have a problem with with nausea and they're prescribed an antipsychotic. You have to explain to them very carefully what's going on. Um, Domperidone, for example, is is a is a D2 antagonist which doesn't cross the blood brain barrier, so that's great as an emetic. So thinking about those those dopamine pathways, the nigroestriatal pathway, mesocortical and mesolimbic pathway do different jobs. So nigroestriatal nigro pathway controls movement, that's the selection of a motor program. That gets degenerated in Parkinson's disease. The tuberoinfundibular pathway controls the secretion of prolactin from the pituitary. So that is why some antipsychotics also cause gyne gynecomastia and galacteria, so there's men developing breasts and expressing milk. The mesolimbic pathway is the, re the famous reward, dopamine reward pathway. And that might explain the schizophrenia's association with anhedonia. So coming back to this issue of uh, selectivity, we, we thought the thought was maybe that atypical antipsychotics may be better because they're more selective. But actually, do you want a drug to be selective? Um, when, when does a bug become a feature? So, for example, clozapine blocks, not only blocks D2 receptors, but it also blocks 5-HT2A serotonin receptors. Now, that's important because receptors, these, these serotonin receptors also inhibit cortical dopaminergic neurons, which synapse onto D1 receptors. So, that means that you can actually counterbalance the block in the cortex. Let me show you how that how that works. So here we have um, a case of 5-HT receptor antagonism enhancing dopamine release in the nigrostratal pathway. Now remember, we want to block D2 in the mesocortical pathway because that's causing the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. But we don't at the same time, we, we, we kind of want to have our cake and eat it. We don't at the same time want to block the, nig the nigrostriatal pathways because that, that's involved in motor selection. That's what causes these extra pyramidal syndromes, the shaking and stuff. So think about what happens if you, when you normally activate the receptor, uh, the synapse, you get this release of dopamine. And normally what happens is 5-HT lands on these 5-HT receptors and through IP3 receptor signaling inhibits the release of dopamine. So we've now got less dopamine being released. So logically, if we, if we block that 5-HT2A receptor, dopamine signaling. So no, anti having side effects is not, not all bad at all. Um, clopromazine has very unpredictable pharmaco pharmacokinetics, which means it has to be titrated individually. But happily, it has a low toxicity, so its therapeutic window is quite high. Unfortunately, about 30% of patients are resistant to first-generation 